for the highest honors in the game of hurling takes place in Dublin, the capital of Ireland. But interest in this all-island final stretches far beyond borders of the Emerald Isle. The thousands of Irishmen fly home across the Irish Sea and across the Atlantic too to make the hurling final the highlight of their annual holidays. And so, on Sunday, 3rd September 1961, 70,000 people came to Croke Park, headquarters of the Gaelic Athletic Association, in anticipation of a double feast of hurling. For they come to see not just one match, but two. For the GAA gives schoolboys equal prominence with their elders, in this the fastest field game in the world. So the minor hurlers of Kilkenny and Tipperary, all under 18 years of age, are first into the arena to decide whether Kilkenny, the reigning champions, may retain the crown which they won in 1960. The Tipperary lads had an extra incentive to win this match because they wanted to show the way to the seniors from their own county, who in the second game of the day were to do battle for Hurling's blue riband, the McCarthy Cup. The Hurling was fast and often brilliant on both sides, but Kilkenny had greater scoring power in their forwards. Freeney, Welsh, Barry, Aylward, Delaney and Kinsler, all having a hand in building up a winning total to which Tipperary could only rip through two scorers, Keating and the accurate marksman Billy Ryan. Though Kilkenny won, both teams equally earned praise for the skill and sportsmanship displayed in this great minor final. The President of Ireland, Ed Valera, was greeted on his arrival by Most Reverend Dr. Morris Archbishop of Cashel and by Mrs. Sean Lamas, wife of Antisha. The men from Dublin were first to appear from under the Cusack stand. They were quickly followed by the Tipperary seniors, anxious to redeem their defeat by Wexford at the same stage last year. A feature of all big hurling games is the parade of the teams before the match begins. Dublin, in their light blue, are led by Noel Drumgoole, Bernie Boothman, Fran Whelan, Laurie Shannon and Paddy Croke. The favourites, Tipperary, are led by Matt Hassett, Mick Burns, John McKenna, while Liam Devaney, Willie and Tom Mullock. The pre-match pageantry ends with the National Anthem. Watches are started and the big game is on. Dublin, who won the toss, decide to play from the railway end. But since there was no breeze to speak of and no dazzling sun, there was little advantage in having choice of ends. The Tipperary, with their many Croke Park veterans, were quicker to settle down. And after only one half minutes of play, John McKenna, trying for a goal, had his shot deflected over the bar for the opening score. Tipperary, one point, Dublin, nil. Thirty seconds later, Jimmy Doyle from a free makes it Tipperary, two points, Dublin, nil. Another minute gone, and Jimmy Doyle races through to put Tipperary three points in front. Dublin were attacking just as often as Tipperary, but the scores were not coming, at least not until the game was five minutes old. Goalkeeper O'Brien clears to the wing. There's Paddy Croke, number 14. He centres. It goes to Billy Jackson. There's Dublin's first point. And here's their second point from a free by Larry Shannon. The Munster men responded quickly to this challenge with a point by Tom Malachny. Tipperary, four points. Dublin, two points. The following scenes indicate that this is not a game for the faint-hearted. Speed, strength, skill and the spirit of give and take are clearly prerequisites of the successful hurler. O'Gara scores a point for Tipperary. Liam Devaney runs in. Across to Matt O'Gara. 
into Donnie Nealon and Bill Malachny, and it's another point for Tipperary. The scoring was still concentrated at the railway end, and soon Jimmy Doyle collected a clearance to shoot another point and to put his team five points in front. defence was kept just as busy as the Linster rear guard, and these exchanges show just how fast and fiercely the battle was waged. last, Dublin got a break, and through Larry Shannon, the lead was reduced to only three points. At the other end, a narrow escape for Dublin, as Doyle beats Lynch and sends into the square. Was it over the line? The umpires have a consultation, and no score is allowed. Half-time came with Tipperary holding a four-point lead. Certainly nothing to be complacent about as the fast-changing fortunes of the second half were soon to emphasize. Dublin immediately went into the attack and did not have long to wait for their reward. Just 14 yards out, Paddy Croke catches the ball, passes to Bowen, Bowen into Billy Jackson, he shoots, it's a goal. And now watch the same goal from another angle. Croke to Bowen, Bowen to Jackson, and Dublin are only one point behind. Paul Boothman shot the equaliser. Dublin continue to set the pace, Boothman to Croke, Croke to Shannon, and Dublin are one point ahead. And though Matt O'Gara equalised for Tipperary, Ackle Boothman again gave Dublin the lead. Donny Nealon has another point for Tipperary. Left winger Billy Jackson has yet another for Dublin. Billy again reduces the leeway. It's Tipperary again, it's Jimmy Doyle again, it's the equalising score once again. The victory would now be won, not only by stamina and skill, but above all, perhaps, through that little bit of luck which plays so important a part in all cup matches. And so, with sharpshooter Jimmy Doyle ever ready to turn a free into a certain score, Dame Fortune and the lead deserted Dublin. Jimmy stretches Tipperary's lead to two points, and this was just enough, in spite of Ackle Boothman's last great point for Dublin. So Tipperary won their 18th All-Ireland Senior Hurling title by the narrowest of margins against worthy opponents in one of the most breathtaking finals in history.